Take your Bible this morning, if you would please, for our scripture reading, do Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, please. We're going to read the first five verses of Acts 19. We'll read them responsively. We begin together on verse 1, then I read 2, and I'll ordinate reading the verses until we end together on verse number 5 of Acts chapter 19. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And beginning on verse 1 of Acts 19. Ready? And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth... Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost? He said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing now to the reading of our scripture this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music today and for the singing of the people of God. Lord, it's good for us to sing praises to you, and Lord, it's delightful to hear. It it, it rejoices my heart. It lifts our spirit, and Lord, I pray it's been a blessing to you this morning as your people have sung praise to you. Now, Lord, we pray your blessing on the special as it's given. I pray we'll listen carefully to the message of the song and you'll continue to prepare our hearts and make us ready to receive a blessing on the special as it's given. I pray we'll listen carefully to the message of the song. And you'll continue to prepare our hearts and make us ready to receive the truth from your word this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word today. Lord, we want to thank you for being our God. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us to this place this morning. Now, Lord, we, I would ask you. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word today. Lord, we want to thank you for being our God. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us to this place this morning. Now, Lord, we, I would ask you that you would help us to give you our undivided attention today. This is the only Sunday morning service, September the 4th, 2022, that we'll ever get to experience. And so, Lord, I pray you'd help each one of us to listen carefully to the still, small voice of your Spirit minister to each of our hearts. Keep our minds from wondering. Keep us from distraction today. Give each of us ears to hear what the Spirit would say to His church this morning. Have your way in each of our hearts this morning. For we ask for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Someone has said the most important thing in life is believing. No, that's not true. Someone else said, well, the most important thing in life is what you believe. That's closer, but that's not true either. The most important thing in life is who you believe. That's the most important thing. John 3, verse 16, most of you are very familiar with that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son does not have everlasting life, but the wrath of God abides on Him. Two groups, that's it. One group are those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And then there's who do not believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's it. Saved and lost. On the way to heaven or on the way to hell. That's the only two kinds of people there are in the world. You, everybody in this room, everyone listening by way of the internet, you fall into one of those two categories. Everybody's there. That determines your eternal destiny, whether it'll be heaven or hell, whether you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now here in Acts 19, Paul meets some believers and he asks them a question, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And of course they answer the question, we've not heard whether they even be... And He asked him a question, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And of course, they answer the question, we've not heard whether there even be any Holy Ghost. They'd not had any teaching, uh, any help along those lines, and so they did not know anything about the Holy Ghost, and they were just baptized under John's baptism. And I'm not preaching on that this morning to help you understand what the John's baptism was compared to the baptism that Paul is going to give them. That's not the focus of the message. What I'd like to focus in on this morning is the question that Paul asked. And that is, since, have you received the Holy Ghost? Now this part, since ye believed. Since ye believed. I put an extra word in there. I put since ye have believed. I think if I talk to most folks, and I know most people in the room, that I, I, I'm, I'm saved. I, if you ask me what I'm trusting in to get me to heaven, I would tell you I'm trusting not in what. I'm not just trusting in, in who I am. I'm trusting in Jesus Christ as my Savior. And that's good. And so you, you would say, yeah, I am saved. Well, what about since you've been saved? Well, Pastor, I believe. What about since you have believed. Well, Pastor, I'm born again. What about since you've been born again? What about that? Uh, What has happened since you have believed? You know, uh, someone say, are you a believer? Yeah, on this date or this time or this place, and you give your testimony of when you received Christ, 
that's wonderful. I'm glad you know when that was. I'm glad you know it took place. And it's not, by the way, it's not necessary that you know the exact time and day and hour and what you were wearing and all that, all that kind of stuff. You just have to, it's not necessary that you know the exact time and day and hour and what you were wearing and all that, all that kind of stuff. You just have to know that you were there when it happened and you ought to know, okay? You ought to know that you're born again. Uh, but the important thing I want to ask you today is what's happened since then? What has happened since you believed? For instance, since you believed, have you been baptized? Look at Acts chapter 2 with me, would you please? Acts chapter 2. This is a church in Jerusalem. As they've gathered together from many nations of the world, all the nations of the earth really, to gather for the feast of Pentecost. And of course, you know the power of the Holy Spirit came and descended upon the disciples there and they preached the gospel. And we know that folks uh, got saved that day. Verse 41, Acts 2 and verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were what? Then they that gladly received his word were what? Baptized. And the same day there had unto them about 3,000 souls. They, they, they received the word. They received the message that Peter preached, that Christ died, he was buried, he rose again for their sins, and they received Jesus as their Savior. For as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So you believe in Jesus. The next thing they did was they were baptized. They got baptized. They didn't wait till they got home. They didn't wait till they invite all the family members over. They didn't wait until they could make a big, send out invitations. Uh, they got baptized right then and there. You know why? Baptism is obedience. It's being obedient to the Lord. And then the Lord took them from there. It pictures, baptism simply pictures the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And when you go into the baptistry and you stand there and we, we baptize you, we say you're buried in the likeness of Jesus. And you're identifying yourself with Jesus Christ. And you're publicly letting people know, I'm trusting Jesus as my Savior. It's a public declaration of your faith, and you're identifying and picturing the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That's why baptism is only by immersion in water. You're not going to picture the death, the burial, and the resurrection any other way. Uh, nobody's ever been to a funeral, and they lower the casket into the ground, and then somebody throws a handful of dirt on top of it and says, okay, they're buried. No, you don't do that. Uh, you have to be completely covered in order to be buried. And when you're buried in the likeness of Jesus' death and raised in the likeness of resurrection, that's baptism by immersion. Go a little to your right in the book of Acts to Acts chapter 8. Here's another instance of a young man from Ethiopia. He's been to Jerusalem to worship in Acts chapter 8. And God tells Philip, as this, he's been to Jerusalem to worship in Acts chapter 8. And God tells Philip as this man is traveling through the, the desert to catch up to his chariot. And Philip uh, catches up to him. And verse number 30 of Acts chapter 8, Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, unto, said Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And then, of course, he's reading Isaiah 53. And notice what he said, verse 34. The eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? And Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You see, before baptism, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. That's always the order. The order isn't baptism first, then believe. The order is believe and then be baptized. It's always the proper order. You say, well, I was baptized when I was young. And then I got saved later. Well, then you, were, you got wet when you were young but you've never been baptized. Uh, you get baptized after you believe in Jesus. And so he believed in Christ as his Savior, and then he commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down, both of them, into the water, 
both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. You go on to Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas have been thrown in jail. And at midnight, you know the story, they sang. He's going to kill himself. Verse 28, Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we're all here. And he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Boy, there's no clearer question ever asked in the Bible. Now, I suppose whatever, if there's any, there's all kinds of things. Just heard somebody today on the radio, you know, that you have to uh, be saved and be baptized. Or you have to live a good life. And you have to, you know, walk the line. And you have to go to church. And all these things. Now, if, if God wanted to include any of that, here's a wonderful opportunity. We'll see if God misses it or whether he hits it. Which does he do? Look what he said. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Hey, you know what? That's the same message I heard. Uh, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Hey, you know what? That's the same message I heard. Uh, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to believe in Jesus Christ. And so he believed. And by the way, they spake the word unto him and to all that were in his house. And guess what? Jailer got saved and Mrs. Jailer got saved and all the little jailers got saved too. Uh, Everybody got saved in the whole family. And guess what happened next? He brought them into his own house and he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And, 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 And... it says when it was, well, we won't get into all that. But he, um, he was baptized, by the way, verse 33, he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and was baptized. Who? He and all his. Why? Because they all believed. Straightway. What straightway mean? Right away. Right away. They didn't wait and say, well, now, look, listen, it's the middle of the morning, or it's early in the wee hours of the morning. He said, man, this is the next thing to do. I'm going to do it. Let's get baptized. It's like that. You, you believed on Jesus and you haven't followed him in baptism. What does hinder you to be baptized? What's keeping you back from identifying with Jesus Christ? What's keeping you back from that step of obedience? Have you been baptized since you believed? The early church folks were in Jerusalem, 3,000 in one day. The Ethiopian eunuch did. While he was traveling in his chariot, just stopped at a body of water big enough for him and Philip to get in so he could get baptized. Here they did, and the jailer and his family in the middle of the wee hours of the morning stopped and made sure that he and his family were baptized after believing. Well, I believe, preacher, have you been baptized since you believed? Since you believed, do you belong? And are you serving in a local church? One, that they that gladly received his word were baptized. And then notice this. The same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Well, who's them? Read earlier in the chapter and in chapter 1, you find out there were about 120 that gathered together in an upper room for prayer meeting. They were there for 10 days, praying, waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit to come upon them. And the power of the Holy Spirit to come. And, and God, God sent that. And now, uh, in one service, the church grew from 120 to 3,120. Now, brother, that's a big day right there. Okay? And uh, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Imagine if 3,000 saved and baptized in the same day. Hmm? I bet you a few dinners got burnt that day. And uh, there's no, no going home for lunch then. You just stayed all day baptizing and seeing folks added to the church. What a great day that must have been. Guys, in the same day? Hmm? I bet you a few dinners got burnt that day. And uh, there's no, no, uh, there no, no going home for lunch then. You just stayed all day baptizing and seeing folks added to the church. What a great day that must have been. And so it's, it's, it's gratitude. Listen, now, so the order is this. You believe in Jesus, you follow him in baptism, you belong to a local church. You get a church family. Why? The gratitude says, I want to serve the Lord. What can I do for the one who has saved me? What can I do for the one who's given me eternal life? 
What can I do for the one who's paid the debt of my sin? I want to do something for him. And how do we show that gratitude? God says, I'm going to give you something called the church. And you're going to be able to serve me through the local church. And show your gratitude through the local church. And that's how we serve the Lord. Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, making the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. And so we, we want to, if, if you, listen, if some of you would decide, I'm just going to be faithful to the house of God. I mean, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You know what? You could cancel your therapist. You could save money on your psychiatrist. You save money on, on, on the problems if you just be faithful to the house of God. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You say, oh, pastor, you counsel with me. I'll counsel with you if you come get the free counseling Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Okay? If you're not interested in coming and get the free counseling for three times a week, uh, then why would I take time out of the week? You know what I found out years ago? Most of the time when someone wants that, I end up preaching to them what I preached on the service they weren't there. I ended up rehashing the widows a few weeks ago on a Wednesday night. So many problems have happened with, with the government trying to help people out. You know why? Because people got out of church. Uh, you, you read, we read about the church's responsibility to take care of those who are widows indeed. And those who didn't, why, why would the church take care of them? Because they were in church. They were part of the church family. And God says, you take care of your own. And we do. But what happens when they're not on your own? Now what happens when they're not part of the church? Then they look to the government to take care of them. And, and it's a sad thing. And so we ought to be faithful to the house of God. We are saved to serve the Lord. We are saved to serve the Lord. And the place you serve Him is the local church. Show me the local show me the folks who don't go to any local church that are in the nursing homes. Show me the ones who don't go to any local church that are that are out knocking on doors on a Saturday. Trying to get people the gospel. Show me the ones that are having bus Saturday. Trying to get people the gospel. Show me the ones that are having bus routes and trying to bring boys and girls to Sunday school and church. They're not there. They don't exist. Serving the Lord through the local church. One of the ambassadors to a foreign country said, you've invited me to tell you about the duties of an ambassador. Let me begin by telling you first of the embassy, the place where we live. The embassy is a little spot of America set down in an alien land. On the walls, we have pictures of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and the current President of the United States with a big flag, old glory, high over everything. Inside the embassy, the laws of our own country are supreme. We celebrate Christmas. Our own country are supreme. We celebrate Christmas, Thanksgiving, and Fourth of July. Outside the embassy, it's different. None of those things are celebrated. Let me repeat. The embassy is a little spot of America in an alien land. End quote. Church should be a little spot of heaven in an alien land. A little place of reprieve. That's why the Bible says the word for church is literally a word that means a, a, a called out assembly. Called out from where? called out from the world you came out from the world and we assembled here we're a called out assembly that's why we don't invite the world in in their music or in their philosophy or in their ways we wouldn't be a church because we're we're not out from the world we brought the world understand this there's only two places you can be you're either in the church or you're in the world church in church once you walk out the doors, you're in the world. And that's okay. That's the mission field. That's where we're supposed to go from here and to go preach the gospel. So you understand, uh, you don't, don't buy into it, mom and dad. Don't buy into parents who say, they, well, I don't believe in making my kids go to church. They'll, they'll resent it later or they'll rebel. 
I've never met a, I've never met a person yet. 30, 40 years old, 50 years old. Teeth all rotted out. Say, well, I don't brush my teeth because my parents made me brush my teeth when I was little. So I refuse to brush my teeth when I get older. And so they gum you to death. Hmm? Get older. And so they gum you to death. Hmm? Never happens. I've had folks say that to me before. Well, my parents forced me to go when I was a kid, and that's why I don't go now. And the truth is, they force you to do a whole lot of other things that you still do today. And the truth is, you don't go to church because your heart's wicked and you don't want to be around the people of God. And I smile at them. Not mad at them, but somebody got to tell them the truth. You say, well, you'll lose them. I don't have them anyway. So you just tell them the truth. Don't, don't hide behind that. Amen. I remember, I think I told this not too long ago, about the, the man who was president for one day. Anybody remember? I think I told this not too long ago about the, the man who was president for one day. Anybody remember who it was? I didn't think so. You can't remember what we said last week, let alone... President James Polk spent his last day as president on March 3rd, 1849. So at midnight, he was out of office. But his successor was Zachary Taylor, a staunch churchgoer. And Zachary Taylor refused to be sworn in to the office of president on March 4th, 1849, because it was a Sunday. He said, going to church is a higher priority than being president of the United States. You need a higher priority than being president of the United States. Amen. Nowadays, people can't even make it a higher priority than going to the ball game. Amen. Or staying up too late to watch one. So he postponed his inauguration until Monday, March 5th. For that one day, U.S. Senator David Atkinson of Missouri was president pro tempore of the United States. One day. Until on Monday, Zachary Taylor would be sworn in. Can you think of anything more important than being president of the United States of America? Zachary Taylor could. He said, being in church. Being in church. Are you, since you believed, since you believed, are you studying God's word? Look at Acts 17 with me. You're still in the book of Acts? Acts 17. Acts 17. Paul's had some problems in Thessalonica, and they get him out of there. And verse 10 says, The brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These, in Berea, were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether, these, whether those things were so. The Bible says we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. It's an embarrassing thing. The, the Bible says we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. It's an embarrassing thing, the lack of Bible knowledge among Christians. Those who profess the name of Christ. The Bible doesn't say study to show yourself approved unto men. It doesn't say study to show yourself approved to yourself. But unto God. Unto God. 
How is it that we can know who won an Oscar or an Emmy or Dancing with the Stars or American Idol? And we don't know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You don't, you don't study to know yourself. You study to know the Word. Study to show that. Read and study and memorize and meditate on the Word of God. In one Peanuts comic strip, Sally is struggling with her memory verse for Sunday. She's absorbed in thought, trying to figure it out when she remembered, I think it was something from the book of reevaluation. She never found the memory verse, but I think it's a good reminder that every time we read the Bible, we ought to read it with the idea of reevaluating our attitudes, reevaluating our actions, and making sure they line up with God's Word. Since you have believed, do you read your Bible? Do you study your Bible? Do you memorize your Bible? Do you memorize your Bible? Do you meditate in the Bible? You know, years ago, uh, I had a saying that someone gave me, and I never forgot it. It says, we find the time to do the things we really want to do. And we find an excuse to do the things we don't really want to do. We either find the time. If we really want to do something, buddy, you'll find a way to do it. And if you don't really want to do something, you'll find an excuse. You really want to know God's word, you can know it. You can know it. When Israel would have a king, go to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy with me, will you? You doing all right? Deuteronomy, we're okay. I only have 47 points here this morning, so we'll get out in time for Emma Jean's party. I'm sorry, I've got to give Brother Avila's time to preach yet. So, so. Deuteronomy 17. We'll have in-flight snack service here soon. Deuteronomy 17. This is God's instruction to Israel for when they're going to get a king. He says, when you have a king, verse 17, chapter 17, verse 17, neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply himself silver and gold. It shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book, out of that which is before the priests of the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein, how long, church? All the days of his life. Why? that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes, to do them, that his heart be not lifted up side from the commandment, to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So one thing your king's going to do, he's going to read this book every day of his life. Every day of his life. You know what a Christian ought to do? Read that book every day of your life. How long? Till the day you die. Okay? Till the day you die and you see him face to face. Someone said, you talk about power, but if you neglect the one book that God has given you, has the one instrument to which he imparts and exercises his power, you will not have it. You may read many books and go to many conventions and you may have all night prayer meetings to pray for the power of the Holy Ghost. But unless you keep in constant and close contact with the one book, the Bible, you will not have power. And if you ever have power, you have power. And if you ever have power, you'll not maintain it except by the daily, earnest, intense study of the Word of God. 99 Christians in every 100 are merely playing at Bible study. And therefore, 99 Christians in every 100 are mere weaklings when they might be giants, both in their Christian life and in their service for Christ. Wow. That was R.A. Torrey who said that, by the way, and he said that in the 1800s.
So since you believed, have you been baptized since you believed? You belong to a local church and serving in a local church since you believed? Are you studying the Word of God? Learning the Word of God since you believed? Oh, Pastor, I'm a Christian. What about you believed? Oh, Pastor, I'm a Christian. What about since you've been a Christian? Oh, Pastor, I'm saved. What about since you've been saved? Since you believed, have you separated from the world? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Notice with me, if you will, 2 Corinthians 6, verse number 14. Paul writes his church at Corinth, and he says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out not the unclean thing. I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. There's to be a difference between a believer and an unbeliever. There's to be a clear distinction from those who follow Christ and those who do not follow Christ. There will be an obvious attitudes are to be different. No longer critical, no longer backbiting, no longer uh, quick to be angry, quick tempered, but caring and compassionate and loving others. Attitudes ought to be different. Appearance ought to be different once you become a follower of Jesus. The, 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 your hair ought to be different. Ladies ought to look like ladies and men ought to look like men. That means ladies ought to have hair long enough, you know they're a lady. Men, your hair ought to be short enough, they know you're a man. To uh, get, get around you or get the front of you or get to look you up and down and survey that you before they decide what you are. Let me help you too. You're either a man or a woman. You think we wouldn't have to say those things, but that's the truth. And, and there ought to be a distinction between the two. Satan would love to wipe out that distinction, but let's, let's leave the, the long hair and the, the earrings and the necklaces to the ladies and we'll leave the, the men to look like men. Amen, Pastor. Good preaching. Listen. Watch, uh, you turn on the football game, it, it's not hard to distinguish who the two teams are. Why? They wear uniforms, don't they? If they're white and gold and navy blue, that's, that's the Notre Dame team. If they're scarlet and gray, that's, that's the Notre Dame team. If they're scarlet and gray, that's the winners. It's Ohio State. Okay, and, and listen, that's, that's how you identify who they are. When Brother Avila's got to go up and, and see the Bears play the Browns in a preseason game, someone gifted him some tickets to, to go up there. And uh, I, I saw a picture, and guess what? He had a Bears jersey on. He had, a, he had Bears gear. Why? He's identifying what team he's on, what team he's for, what team he's with. Okay, what does your appearance do? Does it identify whose team you're on? Or do people get confused by looking at your appearance and wondering whose team you're on? Story told about a stagecoach company was hiring. Story told about a stagecoach company was hiring people to drive its stagecoaches through mountainous areas. The local office manager advertised for the position. People began to apply for the job. As they would be interviewed, the boss would ask each applicant, how close can you drive the team to the edge of the cliff as you round the mountain? The first fellow said, well, I can, I'm skilled enough. I could drive within three feet of the edge of the cliff. The boss thanked him and called in the next applicant. And again, he asked that man the same question. 
He said, I believe I'm so skilled I could drive that team within one foot of the cliff. He thanked him for his time and the next applicant was called in. And he asked that guy the same question. Only this applicant said, sir, I would drive the coach. There's great wisdom in steering your life as far away from the world as possible. Not as close to the edge as you can get. You cannot be a friend of the world and the friend of God. It's impossible. It's impossible to do both. Like the little boy who kept falling out of bed. And his mother would put him back in and he'd fall out of bed. And his mother would put him back in and he'd fall out of bed. He says, why do you keep falling out of bed? He said, I suppose I stay too close to the getting in place. He said, why do people fall out and go back to the world like she sang about this morning? You know why? You got in and since you got in, you haven't done anything else. And it's so easy to fall right back in. You stayed right by the cliff, and it's, so e- and it's so easy to fall right back in. You stayed right by the cliff, and it's so easy to fall over. That's why you get baptized. That's why you be faithful to church. That's why you begin to study the Word of God. And then the Spirit of God begins to talk to you and speak to you, and you begin to take more steps of what the Lord shows you of how to walk with Him. And, and when you do that, you know what happens? The gap between you and the old life, the gap between you and the things of the world, it just begins to widen. Because God's doing something in your heart, in your life. Since you have believed, are you baptized? Since you have believed, are you serving in the local church? Since you have believed, are you studying the Word of God? Since you have believed, are you separate from this world? Since you have believed, are you seeking the lost? Turn over to Acts chapter 20 with me, would you please? Acts chapter 20. Paul testifies here. Acts 20 and verse 24. Paul says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Is, church, is there a hell? Is there a hell people go to if they don't get saved? Then how can that not be our top priority? How can that not be priority number one? To keep people from going to hell. You don't have to open a paper anymore. Nobody gets the paper probably, but, a, but a five people in the room. But go online and just type in obituaries and just read them. Type in obituaries and just read them. There's people in there who didn't expect to be in there. There's people in there who did not expect that that day would be their last day. And you and I don't know that either. We have no way of knowing We're to go after the lost. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. I don't think there's any coincidence the first two letters of gospel are go. Go. Spanish folks yesterday had eight received Christ as their Savior. How'd that happen? Go. They went. So I didn't have anybody saved. Did you go? Don't bow your head. It's not time to pray. got to go that's it's it's the number one job of the church that's it's it's the number one job of the church it's the number one purpose of the church that we go and get the gospel to others that's why there's sunday school that's why that's why we go out and go soul winning and knock on doors and pass out tracts that's why we're putting together three thousand bags with johns and romans and gospel in it and handing them out to people in two weeks why folks need the gospel They need to know about Jesus Christ. That's got to be our number one job. The number one job of the church isn't to have activities. The number one job of the church isn't to have aerobics. The number one job of the church isn't to shut down the abortion clinic. 
The number one job of the church is not to close down the adult bookstore. Number one job of the church is not to clean up the environment. Nothing wrong with any of those things, but the number one job of the church is to try and keep people from dying and going to hell for eternity. I heard women, of course, were rushed to the scene, and the house was ablaze, and the woman in the house was outside, but she was very distraught, and they tried to find out what's wrong with her, and she says, my baby, my baby's still in there. The fire, and she wanted to run back in, and they held her back and wouldn't let her go. So finally a brave fireman said, I'll go get her. And they put that ladder up to the window where the baby's bedroom was and he climbed up the ladder and they turned the hoses on him and tried to keep him as wet as he could and he got into that smoke-filled room and fell over where he fell the crib and reached down and felt that bundle and he picked it up and went over the ladder and again the water on him trying to keep him from burning and he got down the ladder and presented that bundle to his mother. To that lady pulled back the cover and let out a scream. He said, that's not my baby. That's my baby's doll. And her baby perished in that fire. And her baby perished in that fire. That's the church, my friend. That's the church. We're guilty of gathering toys when we're supposed to be rescuing souls for the kingdom of God. Hmm? You ever told someone else how they can miss hell? You ever told someone else how they can know they're on their way to heaven? Hmm? Since you believed, have you ever told someone else how they can believe? We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves. Who's heard that from you? Who's heard it from you lately? I close with this. Number six, since you have believed, have you yielded to the Spirit of God? I close with this. Number six, since you have believed, have you yielded to the Spirit of God? Have you yielded to the Spirit of God? First, yielded to the Spirit of God. First Corinthians chapter 2, please. First Corinthians chapter 2. You still with me this morning? Okay. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 12, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. The moment you got saved, you may not have realized it, you may not know it, but the moment you asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, the Holy Spirit of God took up residence inside of you. If you don't have the Spirit of of Christ, you don't have the Spirit of God, you're none of His. Your body became the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And now He lives in you. Okay? He's there to, He's missing and giving the gospel. You say, man, I just don't think I can do that. Well, you need someone to help you do that. That's why God gave you the Holy Spirit. He gives you the power of the witness. He gives you the ability to witness. He gives you the ability to be fruitful. The zeal, the enthusiasm, the freshness that only comes from the Holy Spirit of God. Hey, yield to Him and die to self and say, God, I want less of me and I want more of you. Less of me and more of you. I die to me and the Holy Spirit of God take over and control my life. That's what He's waiting for. He's a gentleman. He's not taken over. You have to yield to him. You have to yield to him. Spurgeon said, without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are ships without wind, branches without sap, and coals without fire. We are useless. It was Gandhi from India who made this statement. I would have become a Christian if it had not been for Christians wow problem problem isn't believing in Jesus problem isn't believing in Christ the problem is what have you done since 
you believed. Since you believed. Are you an obedient Christian? Since you believed, have you been baptized? Since you believed, have you been serving in a local church? Since you believe, you've been studying the scriptures to show yourself approved unto God? Are you separating from the world, the things of the world? Are you to show yourself approved unto God? Are you separating from the world, the things of the world? Are you seeking the lost? Taking the gospel with you, ready to give it? Ready to take the opportunities that God presents to you? Are you submitting to the Spirit? Yielding yourself to Him? Asking Him to control you and not you to control you? Pastor, I'm saved. What about since you've been saved? Oh, Pastor, I'm born again. What about since you've been born again? Since ye have believed. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we bow before you now this morning. Lord, what a piercing question this was about. But Lord, I'm speaking to people today and it's not ignorance. We just have folks who need to understand and need to obey. I believe many in this room, most if not all, would testify that they believed in Jesus Christ as their Savior. The issue is since. Since then. Since that day I got saved. Since that time I trusted Christ. What's gone on since I believed? Lord, I'm asking you to speak to the hearts today. If some need to take the step of baptism, I pray they do it today. Some need to belong to a church. They need to do that today. Need to begin to serve. Some need to begin to study. They need to bow the knee and say, God, I need to make your word a priority in my life. I don't know the word a priority in my life. I don't know the Bible like I ought to. And I need to take it seriously. I pray, Lord, that we would be separate from this world. It would be an obvious distinction between those of us who name the name of Christ and those who don't. That we would make it a priority that we'd seek the lost. There's many in this room, they've never given a gospel tract. They've never tried to tell anyone. Burden our heart for that. And may we all submit to the Spirit. Realize that we don't do this in our power. We don't do it in our strength. We're useless without your strength and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. I pray you've spoken to hearts this morning, Lord. And have your way in each and every life, please. Right now, with their heads bowed and their eyes closed, I'm going to finish praying in a moment. But I wonder how many folks here this morning would say, Pastor... You talked about since I believed and and I want you to know that I have believed in Jesus Christ as my Savior. There's a time when I knew I was a sinner. I knew I needed a Savior. I knew Jesus was a Savior I needed. I called on Jesus and I believed in Him to forgive my sin and to be my Savior. And Pastor, I know that I'm saved this morning. Here's my hand as a testimony. Will you slip it up right now, Christian? Say that I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put them down. Be here today and say, Pastor, I, I can't honestly say that. And God knows. So I can't honestly say that I'm saved. But, Pastor, I appreciate you praying for me. And I'm not going to embarrass you or call you out, but I will pray for you. Say, I'm not saved today, Pastor. I know I'm not, but pray for me. Would you slip your hand up and say, pray for me? Just slip it up and put it back down. Pray for me this morning. God bless you. Thank you. Appreciate your honesty. What about since you believed? Since you believed. I wonder how many here today would say, Pastor, I'm saved, but since I believed, there's some things I need to get done. Preacher, God spoke to my heart this morning. Please pray for me today.
that I'll do what God tells me to do. Will you slip your hand up for me today? That I'll do what God tells me to do. Will you slip your hand up? Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have your invitation. God has spoken to your heart. You respond to him this morning. I'll be at the front. Need to make a decision for baptism or church membership. Just see me. You want someone to talk to you about how you can know you're saved? We'll have someone take you aside privately and do that. You just want to pray, Christian, and talk to the Lord. The altar is open for you to do that. Heavenly Father, have your way in this invitation now. I pray, God, that your will will be done in each and every heart and life. Have thine own way now, Lord, in each heart. Help each of us to do what you're telling us to do in our heart today. May holy decisions be made for you this morning. And I'll thank you for it. Quietly with your heads bowed, as you stand to your feet. The, quietly with your heads bowed, as you stand to your feet. The pianist will play as she plays. Brother Bob's going to sing our invitation. God has spoken to your heart this morning. Respond to him today, will you please? Have thine own way, That's right. Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way, wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all oh power, surely as I touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. My being, absolute sway, fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. Right, go ahead and be seated for a minute, if you would, please. Appreciate your attention this morning. And uh, we're glad to have Terry Sims coming this morning. And uh, Terry, of course, several weeks ago, she made a profession of faith. I think, what, was it last Sunday night? Or was it two Sunday nights ago? And uh, she visited a nice visit with her yesterday, explained baptism to her. And she wants to follow the Lord in believer's baptism this morning. Let me tell you something about this. James Norman, don't go anywhere. I ask, how did you find out about the church? Because the story is she was in the back parking lot and two of her ladies just happened to be there with a late lunch and she said she'd come back for the evening service. And I said, but how did you know to come to Bible Baptist Church? She says, I was at a park and her son was playing. She was just sitting in her car. So then the guy come up and he tapped on my hood of my car so he wouldn't scare me. And he said, I'm James Norman from Bible Baptist Church. And he started talking to her and gave her a track about the church and talked about the church with her, had prayer with her. So talking to her and gave her a track about the church and talked about the church with her, had prayer with her. And she said he didn't know anything going on in my life, but boy, he sure prayed like he did. And the Lord spoke to her at that time, said, you need to go to that church. And here she came, got saved, is going to get baptized, and she made a profession of faith. And you know what? That guy never said a word. Never said, hey, I'm the one who talked to her. Hey, I'm the one who told her about the church. Never said a word. 
That's a servant. That's a servant right there. Didn't care about credit. Didn't care about his name being mentioned. He probably hates that I'm doing this right now. <laughs> but uh, thank you, James, for being faithful. Thank you for being sensitive to the Spirit of God. I mean, he's just parked with his kids. He could have just been wrapped up in that. No, there's some woman sitting in her car who cares about her. That's a divine appointment. Be, be sensitive to that. And when Be sensitive to that. And when the Lord says, hey, go, go talk to them or go, go just have prayer with them. Do that. Do that. That's God. That's the Spirit of God prompting you. And uh, you never know. You never know. And uh, so, Terry, we're glad. Uh, Tanya, you're going to take her down and get her ready. And we'll prepare to baptize Terry Sims. And uh, Bob will lead you in some songs as we prepare to baptize. All right. Well, let's do a few favorites this morning. Nathan? 21? All right. We'll start with 21. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. On that first onward Christian Twenty-two. Next one over. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fortune. A glory divine. Hundred and seventy six, four seven six. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. cross you got a number for that the old rugged cross you thought I wasn't gonna pick on you didn't you uh, it is 340 340 uh, it is 340 340 All right, three, four, zero. Let's sing that verse together.
the very sin that carries upon the public profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior, and in obedience to his commands, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Pray the likeness of Jesus' death. said, Master, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Amen. All right, let's do a couple more. Kurt? 378. I'm sorry? I can pick the verse this time. It is well with my soul. Let's do the first and the third together. When peace like a Good church. Brother Linderman? 554. 554. Five, when the Savior reached down for me. That's good. Once my soul was astray from the heavenly way and was wretched Let's stand together, shall we? Praise the Lord. Kroger things are in the conference room. So do a little shopping before you go home. Stop through the conference room. Kroger things are in the conference room. So do a little shopping before you go home. Stop through the conference room. It's all the stuff you're not, you shouldn't have, so... All the sweet stuff. And, uh, well, I'm glad I came this morning. I'm looking forward to this evening. Hope you come back. 
be in your place here, Brother Avilas, and uh, looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us this evening. And uh, let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for another wonderful morning together with the people of God. Thank you for Terry's decision, receive Christ, and now obey him in baptism. Lord, may your hand be upon her, help her. You know her situation, you know her desire, and I pray, Lord, you'd help her. Help us to be a, a good influence on her and, and on her sons. Your care. Make us mindful you go with us as we leave this place today. And if you tear, you're coming. Bring us back this evening for the 530 service. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Brother Bob. Good afternoon.